topic is intracranial hypertension. And uh, you already heard uh, from uh, Nino Stocchetti and the and Payen, Didier Payen, that uh, IICP is one of the secondary insults we are trying to control inside the ICU. And as Nino said, the last 12 months has been very intense in discussion about the utility to measure and to treat intracranial hypertension due to the publication of a New England paper. If we return back to the physiology, we can easily understand why we have this problem, because we have a, a skull, a closed container for the brain and the dura mater that is not as sensible. And we have some volume inside, physiological volumes that could change with the age of the patient, because older patients or the subject have more CSF, and younger patients have lower CSF. But the three elements, blood, CSF, and brain, are in equilibrium physiologically, and every change of one of them will produce a change mainly in CSF. Normally, the ICP in normal population is less than 10. You are seated now, you are looking at the presentation, probably your ICP is around zero, between zero and five. So it's not a major problem in physiological condition, and the relationship between pressure and volume is linear. Small changes in volume compensated by changes in CSF, no change in pressure, even if you move, you stand up, lie down, and so on. But the problem comes when we have a new volume. New volume coming inside the system produce a compensatory change of CSF that goes down. And if a new volume, think about an hematoma, Nino was talking about, for example, an extradural hematoma, a contusion developing after a trauma, new volume coming inside the skull produce movement of CSF. And you can take a look at the CT scan, because CT scan give you some information about the compensatory mechanism. In the upper part of this cartoon, there is a normal CT scan. In the lower part of the cartoon, sorry about that, you will find that the compensatory mechanism did work and CSF disappeared or if you have a focal lesion, as we saw in the, previous, in the previous presentation, you can have some midline shift. So indication of movement, mainly movement of liquid, mainly movement of CSF. When CSF disappear from the CT scan, but also from the patient intracranial volume, uh, small changes in uh, volume, let's say in the hematoma, produce higher changes in pressure. And so we, we are facing frequently this problem in the ICU because patient, like Nino described before, comes with an hematoma after a trauma. We have an extra volume, an added volume. We have some compensatory mechanism, and some patient exhaust the compensatory mechanism before arriving in your unit. And why we are worried by, about IICP? Because IICP produce herniation, movement, pressure gradient inside the skull because it reduce cerebral blood flow, and mainly because uncontrolled high intracranial pressure could kill the patient. Thinking about the movement inside the skull, the pressure gradient that could develop after a trauma, after a mass lesion, you can see that the brain tends to find some way for exit the closed compartment, and they go usually toward the spinal space, and we can have herniation compressing the brainstem, herniation under the pharynx, but both of them could interfere with the consciousness of the patient. Corpus callosus is here, is here, and compression on the reticular system could impair the patient, but could also kill the patient due to the compression on the brainstem. Didier did talk about flow. IICP, this is a plateau wave, produce reduction on cerebral blood flow. We have also images with continuous cerebral blood flow measurement with a decrease of flow directly measured in the brain with IICP. This is an old slide and where jugular saturation has been used as surrogate measure of flow, and you can see that IICP, a couple of meters of ICP, are associated with reduction of flow. And we, if you are unable to, con unable to control it, the patient died for this reason. But I think the other point is that we, we are thinking about improving neuroprotection, improving outcome, as Nino said. 
Time spent over a threshold, and the, the threshold of 20 millimeters of mercury comes from the traumatic coma data bank, and Marmarudi published this data. They say that you spend all your time over 20 millimeters of mercury, 100% of time, your probability of dying is very high. If you don't spend time over the threshold, so your volume are in equilibrium, you will have a lower probability of having a negative outcome. Nino did already present this slide, but it's a, a more advanced idea on this concept. concept. More time spent over a threshold, and we will see that the 20 millimeters of threshold is under discussion now in the last slides, and more negative outcome we will have. But if you grade the insult, and we don't stick on the 20 millimeters of mercury threshold, and we say, what is the probability of survival if you have 10, 10, 15, 15, 20, 20, 24, and more than 30, you can understand that higher intracranial pressure are associated with l bigger intracranial volume and with more negative outcome. If you start to think physiologically, like a doctor, you don't start to treat arterial pressure, low arterial pressure, when the arterial pressure becomes 79 because your threshold is 70, is 80. But when the pressure goes from 130 to 110, you start to be worried, then goes 195, and you start to think what is happening to your patient. The way we thought about intracranial pressure till this last month was we have a threshold, 20 millimeters of mercury, and the reaction over the threshold. So if your patient stay all day long 19, and the other patient on the other bed stay 21, one gets treatment, the other one gets observation. And I think if you are a doctor and you think physiologically, 19 and 21 are the same. There are error in the system, but 19 and 21 are the same. So the threshold seems stupid now, look after a couple of years. So what we can do, probably we can identify patients at risk of IICP. We have to decide if monitor and how to monitor them. And when we decide to monitor how to treat intracranial volumes changes. And if you think about the pathway that the patient has for having an increase in intracranial pressure, we have a lot of processes. Trauma, infection, tumor, air also, post-surgical, pneumocephalus, assess, assess uh, many other, edema, all changes in volume could produce changes in pressure. And if you took a look at the evidence we have in traumatic brain injury, even if we start studying it uh, many years ago, we don't have so much strong evidence about changes in volume and intracranial pressure. This is a very old paper. It's a seminal paper. This is by, being published in 1982 and says that if you don't have any mass lesion, the probability of have IICP is low. If you have any mass lesion and the patient is in coma, you have 50, 60 percent probability of having an IICP because you have compensatory mechanism as we described. So the CT scan is an important feature we have to think about, and the patient in coma in traumatic brain injury. From this information comes all the guidelines we have. Patient in coma with a positive CT scan, whatever positive means, edema, CSF displacement, mass lesion, probably require an ICP measurement because the risk is half of the population or more than half of the population. If you think about SIH, subarachnoid hemorrhage, more severe patients have more severe damage, more possibility to have uh, an extra volume, an hematoma, another extra volume like hydrocephalus, and more severe the patient, more high is the ICP, the presentation as ICP. And so the, some guidelines come from this information. More severe patient or patient with hydrocephalus need to have a treatment of these changes in volume. Maybe a ventricular catheter is the best choice in this setting, but you have to think about intracranial hypertension also in this setting. Intracerebral hemorrhage. We don't have real therapy in this setting. Mortality is very high and disability is very high. But if you compare patients uh, that deteriorate and patients that have a bad outcome, IICP, when was measured, was associated with this uh, worsening of the population. But you have to think also that the lesion here is the destruction of the parenchyma, and the outcome is mainly driven by the hematoma. But 
Also, the guideline, American guidance says that ICP monitoring could be reasonable in patient in coma with sign of intracranial hypertension or herniation. So we start to think also to measure the volume in this condition, not frequently done now. But there are some other conditions, for example, hepatic coma, hepatic failure, where an increase in blood flow, some opening of the blood-brain barriers could produce an increase in intracranial pressure. Meningitis, infection, could produce an increase in intracranial pressure. And patients sometimes have sign of very high intracranial pressure. So we have a, a problem. Many patients could experience a change in volume. We have to decide if you have to monitor or not. And I think we need to wait in a single patient the risk of monitoring and the benefit of getting the information. Because if the risk is trivial, almost all the patients could have a, a, a monitoring system. If you put a, a, something outside the brain, like a thermometer, and you have the ICP, probably everyone needs to have an ICP, even if, when you are coughing. If you have to put a catheter inside the patient, you have to weight the risk between hematoma infection and the information you get. In my, in my mind, I classify the monitoring three colors, clinical monitor, non-invasive ICP, and invasive ICP. Increasing costs, increasing complication, going from green to red. And if you think about the situation, you have a CT scan, sign of intracranial hypertension and disorder of consciousness. No, after a trauma, after, let's say, an infection. Probably this patient, being a low risk for high intracranial pressure, could be monitored with clinical, clinically. And clinically means evaluation of consciousness and pupils. And you can use GCS, full score, whatever you want, but you have to evaluate the evolution of the lesion, and probably you have to evaluate also the pupil reactivity, because we can get some information from that. If you have a positive CT scan and the patient with disorder of consciousness is in coma, and you have to define the risk of the patient. We discussed about the hepatic patient. There is high risk for bleeding, so the patient probably needs no, a non-invasive monitoring. Didier already talked about the possibility to calculate CPP and ICP with uh, transcranial Doppler, but if you look at large series, the precision of the system for ICP, I get the 25, I get the 30, I get the 35 is not so strong as we would like to have. Is a strong indicator, but cannot measure precisely ICP. And so we can use other device, for example, an echo of the optic nerve sheet, but that is in uh, conjunction, uh, is linked to the intracranial space, the subarachnoid space in the optic nerve, and the expansion of the nerve is associated with ICP. And the sensitivity, sensitivity and specificity of the method is higher than the transcranial Doppler if ICP goes up fast and this, this slides give you the same information. For example, if you have a patient at risk, but with an elevated bleeding risk, you have, you have to weigh the information and the risk, probably a non-invasive monitoring the right choice. In patient in high risk, as Nino presented the trauma population, probably an ISCP, a ventricular <coughs> intraparenchymal device, are the right choice because the percentage is very high. But for example, it's not right and in the guidelines, but we all, always say, with a normal coagulation, with a normal number of platelets before inserting the catheter. We make a religion of monitoring because we think that monitoring is enough for saving the patient, but monitoring is linked to therapy. And monitoring doesn't do anything if you don't react and you don't use therapy. And so I think we need to think about. We have a portfolio of, of possibility, ventilation, hyperventilation, Hyper is more agent, sedation, paralysis sometimes, external ventricular drainage, hypothermia, the compressive craniectomy. I don't have a perfect receipt. I'm a cook, but I don't have a perfect receipt for making a good cake here. Because as Nino said, different approach across the world, they produce similar results. For example, every center decides his own step case approach, because you start with the thing you think are less dam damaging the patient, and you go 
ahead with more severe treatment. And when you are failing with the first line, you go to the second line treatment, the compressive balbiturate, let's say also hyperventilation guided by multimodality monitoring. And Nino already presented this slide, and I think uh, the main message is most of the patient, almost all the patient had a treatment of ICP. Maybe only sedation and CSF dressing is, is the standard medical treatment. Many other needed the uh, optimization of CPP on osmotic, and other 88% of them require second therapy level. I think you have to start to think about also the effect of your therapy, because if you have a normal ICP, you have a risk of mortality or negative outcome linked to the primary damage. If you have high ICP, so the volume are increasing inside the skull, but you are able to reduce this burden, the time spent over the threshold, you probably have a worse outcome compared to normal ICP, but reasonable. If you lose control, if you are not able to control the intracranial hypertension, as you can see in the slide, thinking about that, the green bar, that is 80 times, 88 times higher compared to normal ICP. So ICP, IICP kills, and if you are not able to control it, whatever you use for control ICP, you have negative effect. The problem we are facing in the last two minutes, in the last year, is this paper, published on December 27, 2012, by Randy Chestnut, on New England, they say the trial of intracranial pressure monitoring traumatic brain injury, what he did is he randomized some patients in South America because they were not using ICP, so there was an equipoise for running a trial. Half of them have pressure monitoring group and was driven with a threshold of 20 millimeters of mercury. The treatment, other were guided by imaging, and the treatment was started according to a schema. And he was looking if uh, treating ICP with an ICP-driven approach was better compared to the other approach, clinical and CT scan. You cannot read this slide, but the message is that everything was clearly defined, was very serious. Also, the CT scan group was seriously controlled, and they made a lot of therapy, and if the patient was deteriorating, they increased the therapy. So they are looking frequently, frequently CT scan, and between the two CT scans, the patient had therapy. One of the problems we had is the outcome-based study, 20 components, it's not the normal way we are and are looking at the outcome. Nino told us that we are too simple sometimes, but this way for representing outcome is quite complex. And was done because they wanted to have a small number in the two groups, 320 all together, 150 for each group. So they increase, let's say, the sensibility, the number of items for having the result. The result is that the primary outcome measured in this way is not different. But I invite you to take a look at the mortality. 44 against 39. It's not statistically significant because there are only 150 patients in every group. But it's what we are looking when we are doing neuroprotective trial, trying to find a difference of 5%. We fail all the times, but what is what we are looking for. And looking at the mortality, there is a difference in the two groups that didn't reach any statistical significance. significance. The community say the trial doesn't document anything, so I stop to measure ICP, someone in the community start to say, so we gather together in Seattle, we Randy Chesnoff, the first author, and we give some statement for understanding where we are, and I'm going to conclude with five statements. The trial did compare two ways for treating a problem, IICP. No one wasn't treated. Both of the group had the treatment. treatment. In the population, using the, that instrument, I present you shortly, there is no difference. So we can say that in that setting, using that instrument, that is not the instrument I'm using every day, is not the mortality, but the compose uh, index, there is no difference. But I think the major point is that we learn a lot. Probably we learn that, for example, our ICP selection of attraction, as I showed to present you, is too primitive, below or higher than 20. And probably we have to think something different. And probably we, are, we will think something different. And I think uh, it's difficult to 
transport the information from the trial because the trial was done very well what as an eye internal validity but the external validity so the transposition to our world looking also the information the Nino presented about the secondary salt is not applicable as it is and has been used on a broad number of patients also without intracranial hypertension. It wasn't a trial on treatment of intracranial hypertension, on two treatment of intracranial hypertension according to, without, and also in patients without measuring intracranial hypertension. Going to the conclusion, my idea is that we learn a lot and we can reach the result through different pathways, as Nino and Didier presented before. But I think today we have to think closely about intracranial hypertension, and probably we have been too simply, simplistic in the past, and in the future, even a stupid parameter like ICP, because we got in the clinic in 1960 by Lundberg this parameter. We are 50 years away from that time. We need to learn a lot of things, and we need to study more of this parameter and try to improve the outcome. Not only using ICP, but also other parameters we didn't discuss today. Thank you very much.